Thanks everyone, we're going to make a start. Um, thanks for coming along to our occasional series, Privacy and Technology. Um, I'm John Edwards, I'm the Privacy Commissioner, uh, and we're interested in uh, fostering public discussion about uh, technological developments which have an impact on privacy. Body worn video cameras uh, um, have sort of burst onto the scene. We're enthusiastic embraces um, local authorities in different parts of the country uh, get out there. Uh, parking wardens and so on with this technology as part of their suite of health and safety um, measures to ensure that their work, workers are not uh, exposed unduly to risk and that um, prompt action can be taken if they are um, um, uh, threatened or assaulted. Uh, sometimes we don't take the time to think of the implications of the new technology. And so that's why it's so great to have someone like Professor William Webster here to just sort of take us back to first principles and say, well, yeah, I know you can buy it off the shelf down at JCARS or whatever, but you know, what are the implications uh, for rolling it up in a public law enforcement uh, organisation? And I'm seeing one of those at the moment. I'm, I'm just about to um, make a report on not a body-worn camera, but a, a camera that's in situ in a, in a um, security-sensitive organisation uh, which captured footage of an individual being assaulted. Uh, one of the issues that came up when the individual <coughs> asked for that footage was that the organisation said, well, you know, we don't have the technology to pixelate out other people or to crop to avoid disclosing other security measures. And you can probably guess my, my response to it. Well, you should have thought of that before. You know, before you put a camera in and start hoovering up all this data, you've got to anticipate that individuals are going to exercise their right to have access to that. So that's just one small example of um, one of the unintended uh, or unforeseen but entirely predictable consequences of the enthusiastic adoption of this new, very useful technology. Professor Webster has been here for three months uh, and in that time has done um, 14 public lectures, so that's a pretty impressive work uh, schedule. He's here as part of the NZ UK Link Foundation uh, visiting program. He's a visiting professor based at the School of Government at Victoria University from his home university of um, uh, University of Stirling. Uh, he's leaving tomorrow, so this is our last chance uh, to make the best possible use of his vast experience in academic um, inquiries into particularly uh, video camera technology and its effect on public services and privacy, so uh, welcome. And if you do doze off or um, miss something, uh, we're live streaming this, uh, so you'll be able to um, look at that on Periscope for the next 24 hours, and after that it'll be uh, on our YouTube channel, on our website. Thank you very much and welcome, Professor. <laughs> Thank you, First of all, Thank you all of you for coming along, giving up some of your lunch time to come and hear me speak. Um, I also have to start with some acknowledgements. First of all, um, I'd like to acknowledge the New Zealand UK Link Foundation for bringing me to New Zealand. Um, they're a foundation dedicated to knowledge exchange, research capacity building between New Zealand and the UK. Typically, they send academics from New Zealand to the UK. I'm the first to come in in the reverse direction. Um, so if you see future uh, scholars coming to New Zealand from this scheme, then you'll know my visit has been a success. Um, so thank you very much to them. I also have to thank the School of Government for hosting me during the last three months, making office space available, emails, maybe providing me with their various contacts in government in New Zealand. So, um, so and also I'd like to thank uh, John and his staff for uh, arranging this, uh, this presentation this afternoon. Okay, so my name is Professor William Webster. Um, back in Scotland, I am a Professor of Public Policy and Management. Uh, the reason why I say that is it has a bearing on how I'm going to approach this topic area this afternoon. So my perspective is not as a criminologist, it's not as a legal scholar, it's very much as a scholar interested in public management and public policy. So I'm very much interested in body-worn cameras and how they are integrating into a public service environment. Back in the UK for my day job, I'm a director of a research centre called CRISP, the logo is up here. Centre for Research into Information Surveillance and Privacy. This is a very unique research centre because it's the only research centre in Europe that is interested in the consequences and implications 
of the surveillance society, in particular in relation to things like privacy and information sharing. We're spread across three universities in Scotland, my university, the University of Stirling, but also the University of Edinburgh and the University of St Andrews. And across those three institutions, we have over 30 researchers and on all sorts of different projects. We are primarily social scientists, so we, are, we have political science, public management, mm. some legal scholars, philosophy, social science, sociologists, etc. etc. We do have a couple of computer scientists, um, and I wish I could understand them a little bit better. Mm. So my background very much is as a social scientist. We have a number of projects on the go and a number of projects that we've finished in recent years. For example, looking at surveillance and democracy, looking at um, um, surveillance in the body, looking at surveillance and public services. I have quite a broad definition of surveillance, which probably isn't necessary for this presentation, um, but it's not typical uh, secret surveillance, it's surveillance in everyday life, surveillance in public service environments. Okay, um, now my plan of attack for this afternoon is going to be to speak for about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, um, and then hopefully there should be some space and time for some questions and some discussion, and um, hopefully I will encourage a number of ideas that you can all take away um, that will be useful. Okay. Okay, so body worn video cameras. Okay, so in recent years we see lots of calls for the police in particular to wear body worn video cameras. So if we can look to the US where there have been calls ever since the killing of Michael Brown um, and President Obama has significantly raised a number of funds for police to wear body-worn video cameras in the States. We see that also mirrored in the UK after the killing of Mark Duggan, um, calls for police to routinely wear body-worn video cameras. And I think there have been a number of recent incidences in New Zealand which have also led to increasing pressure on the police to wear body-worn video cameras. But alongside the use of these cameras in policing environments, we see there are filtering into other public service arenas. And that's partly what I'm interested in, not just body one video cameras as a law enforcement tool, but how it's used in other public service environments, how it's been integrated and diffused into quite complicated um, environments already. So a starting point would be to say that there very little is published on the effectiveness of body worn video cameras, or how they're used, or how they're governed. There's lots of anecdotal evidence out there, but there's very little that's published by uh, that is published, that is robust academic research. So the purpose of the research I'm going to talk about today was partly to help start fill that gap. Um, we uh, observed that um, in the UK we start to see body-worn video cameras in more environments, but we see very little robust evidence about the effectiveness or how they're going to be used. So we wanted to start to plug that gap. So we did a simple piece of research in 2015, which is partly what I'm going to go on and report in this, um, in this presentation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about body-worn video cameras in terms of what they are and how they're used. I'm going to give you some background in terms of the policy context and how they're regulated in the UK. I'm going to describe to you the methodology behind the research that we did. And then I'm going to present some of the key findings and points for discussion that hopefully will, will ignite a few ideas in your mind as we go on. Okay, so Let's start with a couple of news items. Okay, so here's one I found from, um, from New Zealand. This is a listener. Um, I've never actually seen the listener, but I believe it's, a, it's published weekly and it's relatively, it has a relatively good reputation. Um, this particular article from July, so it's relatively recent, this article is calling for more body-worn video cameras in, in New Zealand. Um, but what I think is pretty important of this article is just given away in the second line where it says, given overseas experience, the case for police body-worn cameras seems to be incontestable. So there's a sense of inevitability about body-worn cameras being used by police in New Zealand in the future. So that's the article from, from, from New Zealand, but I have one from a, also from a similarish period back in the UK. So this is from March. Um, this is also from a, from, a, from a good news source, The Independent. Um, but the, but the, uh, this article had, takes a completely different direction. Um, it doesn't talk about body-worn cameras being irresistible. What it talks about is how body-worn cameras are changing the justice system. That's a grand claim, that a simple piece of technology is changing the justice system. Okay, so what the article goes on to provide details about is how the, um, the Metropolitan Police in the UK are investing over £3 million in body-worn video cameras, and by the end of 2016, 
the vast majority of police officers in the UK will be wearing body-worn video cameras. Now, part of my research was to uh, explore whether or not that was happening on the ground. That relates specifically to the Met. So talking about 22,000 cameras used by the Metropolitan Police. What's, what's equally interesting about this, art, this article is that it starts by saying that the main benefit of body-worn cameras that the police perceived was in terms of information gathering, evidence gathering, which would be used in a court of law. They, that was the initial primary purpose. But over time, they discovered that actually it's mostly beneficial in providing evidence in cases of complaints against police officers. So they found a shift in purpose. In some ways, this goes to the point that John made in his opening comments, that sometimes with new technology, you don't really know what the outcomes will be. So it's pretty important that you get the purpose set out from the beginning. So we see, in this case, a shift in primary purpose, which makes it quite interesting. Again, the article has a degree of speculation in it. Again, now I would argue that points to the need for more robust academic research. OK, so a place to start might be, what would be the sorts of questions that I would ask in terms of the use of body-worn video cameras? So I would start by asking, what actually does the technology do? What is the technology? So what do we mean by the term body-worn video? Uh, it is a little bit like CCTV. It's a label which doesn't accurately describe what the technology does. It's, so body-worn video is on the body, but it doesn't just have video recording capability. It nearly always has audio recording capability as well. So the term is just a label. So what I'm interested in is how are the cameras being used in a public service environment? How many cameras have been dis uh, diffused? How they're regulated? What are the policy issues? What are the governance issues? Um, are privacy concerns being considered and raised in the diffusion of uh, body-worn video? Also, um, how does it change relationships between the providers of a service and those receiving a service, or even citizens? Um, and are there issues associated with workplace surveillance? So who is it who's actually under surveillance? Is it a service user, a citizen, or is it the operative, the, the frontline member of public service staff? And I would also add a, a subsequent question to that list. And that is, have we learned anything from the diffusion of CCTV? We've had 20 years of the use of CCTV. We've had a, a number of uh, codes of practice put in place, lots of good governance arrangements, and we've had a series of mistakes over the num a number of years. So have we learned anything from that process which can inform the way the body-worn video cameras are used? Should we be thinking of dash cams in the same way? <coughs> I will be mentioning other sorts of uh, Body worn, if you like, in a moment. So yeah, that dash cam comes into the picture. Okay, so just as a, just uh, just so that we're all on the same page, uh, I thought it would be useful just to explain very quickly what we mean by the term body worn video. So they are typically small cameras worn on the body of the person, and typically frontline public service providers. Usually, they're affixed to a uniform in a standardised location. Uh, they usually, well, they always record video, but very nearly always record audio, and they record interaction between citizens, service users, and public service officials. They're usually accompanied with some sort of warning, a visual warning, that surveillance is in progress, often an, uh, a warning also from the frontline member of staff that they are recording video. They are primarily seen as a piece of protective equipment for the member of staff, and as a source of providing evidence of incidents when they occur. And typically the rec recordings um, are gathered and used as sources of evidence, either for court cases or for training um, and other purposes like that. So the data, the way the kit works, is that the data is usually stored and encrypted on the actual device, and then it's downloaded at the end of a shift when it goes back to base, uh, downloaded and cleared for the next day. So that's typically how the system works. So I have some photographs of body-worn cameras, um, just so that we can all have a little look at what they're like. So first photograph, um, the things I would point out about this particular image is that this is not a police officer. This is a civil enforcement officer, a community safety warden. They don't have power of arrest, but they have power of restraint. Um, obviously, they, they, you can tell already, they do actually look like police officers. Uh, what's interesting about this particular piece of kit is it has a it has a screen displaying what's being captured by the, the camera. So if you were talking to this, this officer, you would see yourself in the screen. So that's seen as best practice. You will also notice 
that there is a very overt sign indicating a global sign saying there's a surveillance camera uh, in operation here, the yellow warning sign. Okay, so that's, uh, that's one example. This is, a, this is an example from a police officer in the UK. Again, you can see that the location is worn on the chest. Um, again, it has uh, some sort of warning, but this time it says CCTV. And you can probably guess, guess quite clearly where the, where the camera is. Okay, here is uh, a police officer in Scotland. Okay, what's interesting about this particular piece of equipment is that it actually looks like an identity badge. So it's actually slightly harder to see where the camera is here. Uh, the camera is on that, that piece of equipment. It looks like an identity badge. Uh, there is also the warning, the CCTV warning. Um, the image, uh, if you're wondering what that image is, that's the image we use for speed cameras. So I think they've probably made a little bit of a mistake here with, with their imagery. They'll probably change that in future. They're one of the first, um, one of the first forces to use body-worn cameras in, uh, in the UK. So, but body-worn cameras don't have to be worn on the chest. They can, be, they can be worn in other ways. So here are some examples from the States. So we have one attached to glasses. Obviously it gives a very similar view to the eye, which is very useful in certain instances. And then we have one mounted on the shoulder, lapel camera. Now, these sorts of arrangements are often very useful for armed officers, because armed officers will hold guns in different ways, and they will often cover a body-worn camera with their, with their arms as they're using the weapon. So they need to find other sorts of solutions for, for those sorts of, uh, those sorts of uh, applications. Okay, so what are typically the arguments put forward for body-worn video cameras? Um, and I've already alluded to a number of these. So if we look through uh, the various uh, public policy literature, we'll see that there are a number of, a number of arguments about why body-worn cameras are diffusing into public service environments. First of all, they can protect frontline staff from assault. That's, that's one of the primary purposes. They also provide evidence of incidents uh, when they occur, but also more general interaction with citizens and service users. So they can be very useful for training. They're very useful to see how your staff interact with the general public. Arguably, body-worn video cameras are very useful in reducing the amount of time spent investigating complaints, complaints against officers. So um, this was what I was alluding to at the very beginning in terms of the, what the police have discovered in the UK in, in terms of their use of body-worn video cameras. And it's also argued that they provide lots of very useful responses to a number of antisocial behaviour activities such as vandalism, graffiti, drug use, illegal parking, etc, etc. And what we see in policy terms is increasing pressure and expectation that the police will wear body-worn video cameras. At the moment, um, putting aside the, the, the uh, deployment by the Metropolitan Police, they typically body-worn video cameras are worn for every armed incident. So when, when an officer bears arms in the UK, they are likely to wear a body-worn video camera, but also when they attend an incident of, the, the, of domestic abuse. The reason being is that traditionally, uh, it's difficult to secure evidence from victims. They often retract evidence or won't give evidence. So body-worn video cameras often in those circumstances provide another source of evidence. But what we see, um, which I think is quite interesting, is we see a creep. We see a, we see a creep in terms of the way that the cameras are used. So they're being used increasingly by police forces, but we're seeing the cameras diffusing and creeping into other public service environments. And that's partly what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in body-worn cameras as just a law enforcement tool. I'm interested in how they are filtering down into other public service environments. But we also see that it's partly a result of the way that technology has changed. So camera technology has got smaller, uh, collecting and storing data has become easier, which means that body-worn video cameras have become a more realistic opportunity. But they're, they're not the only source of micro cameras that we see. So police are also using head cams. Um, we also see dash cams. There are some countries in Europe whereby it's to get insurance, uh, Eastern Europe in particular, you need some sort of dash cam on your car. Uh, we also increasingly see incidents of the general public recording um, with their mobile phones what public service um, staff are doing. So the miniaturisation of technology is becoming more normal and we see many different sorts of applications of that. Okay, if we look at the policy, oh, that's the wrong word. If we look at the policy context, um, we can see that the use of body-worn cameras in the UK extends over 10 years. So we can see the first trials by the police 
in Hampshire, in the Isle of Wight and Plymouth in around about 2006, in Scotland a couple of years later, culminating in the big investment by the Metropolitan Police over the last year. Um, we see lots of anecdotal evidence. So lots of public services who are trialling and using body-worn video cameras and putting forward their own anecdotal evidence about how there are less assaults on their staff, uh, there are reductions in crime. As an academic, of course, I would always question anecdotal evidence. I would question its source. I would question how robust it, that evidence has been collected. And I would call for more robust academic research. I would say the one agency that has undertaken some very extensive research is the police in the UK. They have done some very extensive research on the different types of equipment that can be used, uh, how it can be used in a policing environment, um, how police officers respond to the use of body-worn video cameras, and how the general public feel about body-worn video cameras. Uh, and the figure that they quote in, uh, in, their, they, in, their, uh, in their research is that there is a over a 30% fall in the number of complaints against police officers wearing body-worn video cameras. When it comes to other issues, in particular reductions in crime, police findings are largely inconclusive. So as a, as a good academic, of course, I would always call for more research. Um, what we also see is that part of the leverage for use of body-worn video cameras has been by high-profile events. So I previously referred to the killing of Mark Duggan. Um, and this has led to calls that for the police to wear body-worn video cameras all the time. So we have these high-profile events that are often used as policy leverage. But what I think is equally as important is... So not just police environments, but also public transport, NHS, car parking, community safety, prison wardens, etc., etc. So there are lots of environments we're starting to see body-worn video cameras. Very briefly, um, the framework for regulating this sort of technology. Um, this is a UK perspective. Um, you hopefully can see your own parallels to New Zealand. Um, the point I would make about this list here is there's no specific act or code of practice that relates specifically to the regulation of body-worn video cameras. There is an assumption that existing regulation for CCTV, codes of practice about how CCTV is regulated, will also apply and be applicable to body-worn video cameras. So the, um, the first couple of bullet points on that list are about the overuse of, of surveillance cameras in public spaces by public agencies. So we have a UK surveillance camera commissioner, which is a, 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 a UK innovation in terms of the regulation of surveillance cameras, and he has a code of practice which he believes applies to body-worn video cameras. The Re Regulation of Investigation Powers Act, that relates specifically to covert surveillance, so the use of secret surveillance um, and body-worn cameras do sometimes fall into that category. And then we have the Data Protection Act, which is the equivalent of your Privacy Act, um, and a code of practice by our Information Commissioner, which relates to the use of surveillance cameras. So we have regulation in place for these sorts of technologies. Um, much of it relates to the collection of personal data, giving uh, subjects access rights to that data, and giving indications of how that data should be collected, processed, stored and used. Okay, so what was our research? Okay, so um, I've spoken quite a bit about um, anecdotal evidence, I've spoken quite a bit about body-worn video diffusing into different environments. Our research was quite simply what's going on out there, what's really happening in the world of body-worn video cameras. So we, we defined our research geographically in Scotland because we wanted to make it achievable. Um, and we wanted to focus on public service contexts. We did a, a literature review of academic materials and, and practitioner materials. We looked at media coverage in the US and the UK. And we designed a comparative analytical framework which helped us understand what was happening in practice. I'll come on to that in a moment. And we used four case studies. These were four case studies where body-worn video cameras were being used prominently in Scotland. Policing, uh, traffic enforce, enforcement, which it was uh, car parking, and then public transport, which was railways, and the warden service. I will explain what the warden service is in a moment, but it was community safety. And we had a number of interviews with each case study area. Uh, we went to visit sites where body-worn video cameras were being used. We spoke to people using body-worn video cameras. 
And then we presented our findings at a number of forums, the Scottish Privacy Forum, and also the Computers, Privacy and Data Protection Conference in Brussels, which was essentially a practitioner conference. So the research process was meant to be comparative, it was meant to be objective and robust. So here was the analytical framework that we used. Okay, so the idea here was that we could map body, the use of body-worn video cameras by using this framework as a guide. So we, in each case study, we looked at historical development. So when did you start to use body-worn video cameras? How much did it cost you? What were you using them for? What was the context for the use of those body-worn video cameras? We talked about the purpose. So what did you think were going to be the benefits of using body-worn video cameras? What was the primary purpose of these cameras? We briefly asked about technical specifications, mostly because we wanted to get a guide about what sort of personal data was being collected, what sort of surveillance capability was being used, so what sort of technical standards were embedded in the technology. How were they being used? How were they being integrated into existing public service activities? What were the practical difficulties of using the technology? Were you changing your service as a result of using this technology? Then we looked at governance arrangements, issues to do with uh, how official the policy was around body-worn video, whether or not there was a code of practice, whether or not there was some sort of oversight of their, in relation to their use, whether or not operatives were given training. And then we looked at data management, so how the, data, the personal data was collected, processed, used, etc., etc. And then we, very briefly, we, we tried to capture how they were experienced, so how did the staff feel about using body-worn video cameras, and also how did they feel that the citizen service users being surveyed responded to this sort of surveillance. So that was our framework, um, and what we did was we went into each of our four case studies um, and captured this sort of information. And I'm going to talk very briefly about each of the four case studies. So, we'll start with policing. Okay, so in Scotland we can see that um, 2008, Body-worn cameras were, were piloted, not a huge number of devices, 30 to 40 devices, but we see that they've been rolled out um, across a broader geographical area with more devices being deployed. Now, the way that they've been used in Scotland is that they are switched off. They are only switched off when an incident occurs. Um, and when that happens, the police officer advises the people under surveillance or the people involved in an incident that they are switching on the camera. Now, there obviously is a, a degree of discretion there. Um, a police officer is not going to say to, uh, to somebody, can you please stop mugging that old lady because I need to switch on the camera, right, you can carry on again now. There obviously is a degree of discretion in the, way, in, uh, in the, in the switching on and switching off of, of cameras by police officers. In fact, somebody said to me, uh, I'd be more worried if, uh, if the police officer said to me, hold on a minute, I'm just switching my camera off. Uh, that, was, that was the point at which you should worry. Obviously, that was, that was a joke. Um, Okay, so in the policing environment, lots of positive anecdotal feedback from both officers and the public. So police officers felt that having a, wearing a body-worn camera uh, mediated um, their relationship with citizens. They were less likely to get verbal abuse, and, and citizens in general um, behaved a little bit better. Um, so we also saw that there were improved detection rates. Again, this is anecdotal. Um, less time was spent in court dealing with complaints and the police put, put forward evidence of examples where guilty pleas were made very early on in the prosecution process which led to less time spent in court. That might be what the article was referring to at the very beginning, changing our justice system uh, because there's, 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 it's much more efficient in terms of the use of court time. So. Um, what we saw in this case then was that um, there was the appearance that the body-worn video cameras moderated behaviour and we also saw a very discretionary use in the way that body-worn cameras were used. In terms of governance and data processing, they had, a, they had quite a rigorous process in terms of a very clear code of practice, very clear guidelines about how long the information will be kept. Um, we had very clear guidelines in terms of who had access to that information and what sort of audit trail would exist when information was passed on. So there was quite a rigorous, um, rigorous set of information handling protocols. Um, interestingly, um, police officers were advised if you reach for your notebook to make a note, if something is warranting 
a, a, an official police note, that's probably when you need to switch on your, your video camera. Okay, so that was, that's policing. Car parking. Okay, so this is traffic wardens. And I think um, in the opening comments, uh, the Privacy Commission was indicating that traffic wardens here in Wellington wear uh, body-worn cameras. And in my last 24 hours here, I'll try and see if I can see some. Um, okay, so uh, traffic wardens started to use uh, body-worn video in 2012 in, a in an area, a geographic area which matched a local authority area. Only 14 devices, so not a huge number. And these were switched on from the moment the traffic warden left the office, left, the, left, left base. Uh, so they were, they were on continuously. They recorded uh, video continuously and they recorded 360 degree sound continuously. That very ex inexpensive piece of equipment, so uh, the devices plus the storage equipment plus a maintenance contract was something in the region of do my calculations now, 60,000 <coughs> New Zealand dollars, uh, which was seen as a very inexpensive piece of uh, personal protection equipment. Now, the way that the kit was used was that the actual traffic warden had very little interaction with the kit. They switched it on, they put it on, they went about their business, and when they got back to base, they passed it over to the manager. So it was the manager's responsibility to uh, ensure the transfer of personal data and who had access to personal data. There were retention periods in place for, um, for the personal data, if it was to be used as evidence or not, and destruction at the points. Um, there was a degree of apprehension amongst staff. They felt initially that actually the device was really meant to check where they were going and what they were doing. Um, of course, traffic wardens have a huge uh, discretion about where they travel over the course of a day. Um, now it's seen as an essential piece of their personal protection equipment to the point at which traffic wardens in this area are not allowed to leave the base without a body-worn video camera, and if the body-worn video camera does break down, then they have to work in pairs. So it's now seen as an essential part of changing that, that particular public service. Lots of anecdotal evidence of changing staff relations with citizens as a result of wearing body-worn video cameras. I don't know how the professional parking traffic wardens is seen here in New Zealand, um, in the UK, uh, shall we say that they often get verbal abuse. Um, it's not seen as the most prestigious of, uh, of occupations. So what we also see though is that they can show that over time there is a, no a reduction in the number of incidents of their staff being assaulted and they have actually secured convictions as a result of the, the footage from body-worn video cameras. Um, what we see here also is that they have a code of practice in place, but not a code of practice for body-worn video cameras. They rely on the code of practice that the council uses for CCTV. So um, they don't have a specific set of arrangements, they just are relying on a generic code of practice which could also apply to body-worn video cameras. I think in this case there are some concerns about the amount of personal data that's being collected. Uh, traffic wardens do not, uh, do not face hundreds of incidents a day. Or being abused, they, get, they might they might get abused daily, but not hundreds of incidents. So the degree to which they should be allowed to undertake mass surveillance, also surveillance of conversations that are behind them, not in the line of vision, I think can be open to open to question. Um, and I suspect that some of these things will be will be changed over time in this particular case. Public transport. So this is um, the railways in Scotland. Okay, commenced relatively recently. Scotland wide application. Only 21 devices, so please note that the numbers of devices are actually quite small in all these case studies. Again, switched on only when a situation occurs, and they're actually only worn on particular services where they know that they have historical issues. Um, again, the, the actual ticket inspector has very little control over the equipment. He puts it on, at the end of the day he passes it over to the supervisor. Again, clear attention periods for data in terms of evidential data and data that's not going to be used as evidence. In this case, we have very mixed reactions from staff, and initially the, the use of body-worn cameras was disputed by trade unions and blocked. The feeling here was that the body-worn video cameras were actually all about monitoring the behaviour of staff and not really the interactions with service users. So the staff perceived it as a management tool to gather evidence against uh, members of staff um, and how they, how they treated the general public. So there was a, a degree of resentment in this particular case study. 
Um, there was, again, anecdotal evidence that of redu reduced assaults on members of staff. And over time, the anecdotal evidence was that staff started to feel a little safer wearing body-worn video cameras um, in, in these particular instances. Again, um, we have some, some governance ar arrangements in place, but we don't have any protocols in place for governing personal data. It's not codified in the code of practice. Again, the assumption is that the code of practice for all of the railways in Scotland by this provider will cover the use of body-worn video cameras. So they haven't spent a huge amount of time thinking about specific privacy issues in relation to body-worn video. The warden service. Okay, so this is community safety. Okay, so wardens in the UK um, don't have the power of arrest. They have the power of restraint. They are typically provided by local authorities to support local communities. Uh, local communities which may have historical uh, difficulties. Um, so they are there to allow, they're allowed to, to help people uh, make, this, make an environment feel safer. Now again, relatively small number of devices, only 30 devices. Again, this is at one local authority area in Scotland, a reasonably large one, albeit. Again, discretionary use, so they're not switched on all the time, they're only switched on for an incident, and the general public are advised when they are switched on. Again, defined retention periods. Again, a secure downloading system, whereby the, top, the equipment is passed back to a supervisor. Again, a fear that it was a management tool to see what staff are doing. Over time, it was felt that these provided extra security when staff were working late at night. So working late at night in possibly dangerous environments, these equipments provided a little bit of extra um, security. Lots of anecdotal evidence of uh, members of the public, particularly adolescents, saying, well, if you're filming me, I'm going to film you. Uh, so there's lots of, lots of tales uh, of this sort. Um, the quick, the kit in this sort of in, in this sort of instance provided proof of incidents, helped resolve complaints about the behaviour of staff. Units individually quite expensive. In this particular service, they felt that um, there was a very high risk that the equipment would be grabbed. Um, they're working in quite late night scenarios um, that the equipment could be grabbed, so they needed the highest level of encryption. So they were prepared to pay more for this particular kit to ensure that if somebody did run off with a unit, they couldn't download that material. Okay, so there was also some evidence in this particular case study that uh, body-worn video would inflame a situation. And so sometimes the warning wasn't given if it was about to be switched on. Again, in this instance, data processing arrangements were not codified. There was no code of practice indicating how these, these sorts of systems should be used. Okay, so there the were the four case studies. Now, what would, I, what would I say about these four case studies in relation to... Uh, in, in relation to public service practice and privacy, I think there are some very obvious things that I could say. First of all, we see very divergent practices across the four case studies. There isn't a set practice in how body-worn video cameras should be used. And I've just picked out a few of those divergent practices here. So we could look at retention periods. They varied in the four case studies from two weeks to three months. So the view of those four providers was very different in terms of how long they should keep that personal information. We saw very different technical standards and capabilities. So we saw, for example, different levels of encryption in each of the four case studies. One case study didn't have any encryption at all, um, which I would say was, was slightly a risky approach. We also saw completely different levels of surveillance, i.e. when the systems were operating. So we saw some systems which were meant just to capture the conversation and the view of the public, the frontline member of staff, but we saw other systems that were capturing conversations behind um, and were actually <coughs> capturing surveillance beyond the service being provided, but just of everybody going about their day-to-day -day business. We also see very different perceptions about who is being surveyed, whether or not it is the employee of the public service or the citizen, or the citizen, or the service user. So different ideas about who is under surveillance using body-worn video cameras. And then we saw very different arrangements in terms of uh, in terms of governance arrangements. So whether or not there was a code of practice about how body-worn video cameras should be used. And in only half of our case studies did did they have a code of practice for body-worn video. The other two the other two case studies relied on other more generic. Uh, practices. 
And then we see very different arrangements in place in terms of oversight and reporting. And this was very variable. So one, one agency, for example, kept a very clear record of who accessed footage, <laughs> when and how. Other agencies would just use the, uh, use the footage in an ad hoc way. For example, to show how one of their frontline members of staff uh, maybe could improve their, their, their courtesy to the general public as they went around their business. So very different arrangements in place about using the footage. And then we see different levels of training for managers and staff. So much of the training that we saw was, was about the technical side of using the equipment, uh, not about the way that information processes, information is collected and handled. So the training was very much about how you, you make the equipment work technically and how you make sure you bring it, you, you, you work the system when you get back to the base. Um, so very divergent practices in each of our case studies. Okay, so this could raise a number of points of discussion. We could argue quite clearly that body-worn video cameras are diffusing into lots of public service contexts. Our research shows that the numbers are smaller than they're often reported in the press. Um, we also see that there are routine calls for the police to be, walked, to be issued with body-worn video cameras. Um, that isn't necessarily going to be the case in the UK. I'm not sure what the situation here is in New Zealand. We also see that body-worn video cameras are becoming a kind of normalised piece of technological equipment between frontline public service officials and citizens and service users. We're becoming normalised to the use of that technology in those environments. There's a sense of inevitability that frontline staff will be wearing body-worn video cameras. So I would argue at the moment we're relatively new <coughs> into the future of this technology, but where will the front line of public services stop? So, it's, we want, so I've been talking about law and order, law enforcement, um, I've been talking about traffic wardens, but you can equally see that body-worn video cameras could be used in hospitals. Um, you know, where, where would you stop with that diffusion? In schools, teachers, academics, for example, should we be wearing body-worn cameras? So when I get back to, uh, back to the School of Government and I say, oh yes, there was a huge audience of over 200 people crammed into that room, there will actually be some evidence that actually it was about 60. Um, so uh, where, where are we going to draw the line in terms of where body-worn video cameras should be used? Nursing homes, care homes, you can think of all different public service environments um, that, that, that they could be used in. We also see lots of anecdotal evidence about changing behaviours between those who are the surveying and those who are being surveyed in, and who is under surveillance, the employee or the citizen. So go back to the original story that I started with about the police in the UK saying that originally they thought it was an evidence gathering tool. Now it's a tool which provides evidence about how their officers interact with the general public. So it's interesting that the discourse has changed in relation to body-worn video cameras, that maybe holding the police to account through body-worn video cameras is seen as a more public-friendly discourse than just another technology that gathers evidence of incidents. So we could say that this is becoming a new dimension in citizen-state relations, just like surveillance cameras 20 years ago. What I would also say is that body-worn video cameras have not been accompanied by particularly clear guidelines covering how they're used and oversight, how, they are held, how people who use them are held to account. And you could say in some cases there is some good practice. Um, I would say the police, the police evidence, the evidence from the police in the UK is that they are following good practice. But you could say in some of our other cases that there is some quite poor practice. And even, uh, I would argue, that some instances are bordering on being illegal. So practice is very different um, in terms of how the technology is used, but also in terms of how the data is managed. Um, and I would then argue, if this is the case, then we could say, have we not learned anything from the CCTV revolution from the mid-1990s onwards? I feel that we have been here before. We've seen a diffusion of a technology, surveillance cameras, we've seen good practice, bad practice, and we're now at a point where we know what the good practice is. Signage, uh, clear guidelines about access to information, um, and this sort of experience should be informing the use of body-worn video cameras, and I think in some instances it's not. Um, so I'm going to finish there. Um, I do have references, um, and... These are my contact details. 
Uh, if you would like this copy of the slide, you're very welcome to them. You can either, con you can either get them by just, just contacting me. Uh, they will also be on the video stream and on the Privacy Commissioner's website, linked to this presentation. But you're very welcome to copies of the slides. Um, and basically, now we're at that point where you get to ask questions and we start a discussion. So, over to you. Okay, so again, I would point to existing practice relating to the use of CCTV footage. There are very clear guidelines in place now about when a public agency can release footage to the media. Um, and they're very clear guidelines. It might be in relation to an investigation for unidentified people, or it might be to um, that the evidence has been used in a court, which then has to be made public, or it could be in relation to a particular policy initiative. So there are very clear guidelines about when video footage should be available to the, to the media. In the four case studies we looked at, um, there was no evidence, it didn't come up once, that any evidence from, any footage from body-worn video cameras had found their way into the, into the public domain via the media, but that's not to say that it wouldn't happen, it could still happen, um, and there may well be incidents for example, um, there could be a very critical incident to do with a police shooting or a terrorist act where it's deemed in the public interest to make that footage available. I suppose the difference with CCTV though is that there's no number of um, organisations with that CCTV footage, whereas with the confusion of this yep. body um, worn. I, I, I would say. Banking companies with yep. cameras, that would be really yep. really good. Yep, okay, and two of our case studies here were pseudo public private. Uh, partnerships um, and so it's very clear if you are a data controller and you release data inappropriately such as uh, video footage um, mm -hmm. you're contravening the Data Protection Act in the UK and presumably the same would apply here in terms of the Privacy Act um, and you, you could be investigated and fined but again that's not to say it wouldn't happen so you're, you're, you're all stunned or bored. <laughs> is there any evidence yet of <clears throat> in sort of uh, Wi-Fi rich environments where the data is streamed directly from the camera to the face? Okay. So yeah. Moves okay. So the at the moment the way that technology is used is that it, it reasonably exists in isolation. So it is it is uh, a, a piece of kit that relates only directly to its base back in back in the in headquarters. But it wouldn't be too difficult for us to think about future changes in technology. So at the moment, there is no live stream of streaming in any of the examples that we found. Um, but it wouldn't be too difficult. For example, uh, a, public, a frontline public service member of staff working in a city centre environment where there is universal availability of Wi-Fi, it wouldn't be too hard, I don't think in the future, to have some sort of live streaming. <coughs> also, let's think about the developments in CCTV. So, we know back in the 90s that the cameras were pretty basic, they were analogue cameras just capturing images. We now have smart CCTV which has lots of analytical devices so cameras could be linked with other sensors and computerised technology so they can recognise behaviour, they can recognise faces, not all cameras of course, these are the minority of cameras, but they can be linked to devices that can listen and smell. Now we can assume the way that technology changes that those sort of applications will in the future also be linked into body-worn video. I think in the first instance what we might see are, uh, are footage streamed back to CCTV control centres, but at the moment in the cases that we looked at, that didn't happen at all. They were separate from main CCTV control centres. I mean, I, I'm not a technologist, I can't predict <coughs> the future, I'm, I'm only just putting it out there. That I was thinking it's just not necessarily live streaming, but just for storage and security. Um, okay, well, you could think about all the different ways that public agencies store personal data um, and they use various solutions. Um, at the moment, I would say the solutions that we saw were PC-based um, in, in each of the four case studies. Um, I, I know at the moment you, you put up some of the rationalizations the various agencies um, mm -hmm. developed for why they're doing this. Mm -hmm. um, but to what extent might you agree that this might still be the wild west phase where the technology, the availability of the technology, the ability to do things, is driving 
you know, what they're doing rather than any considered upfront. Yeah, I, I think there's a really interesting relationship between new technology and public policy because in essence new technologies are new. We don't necessarily know the outcomes and the implications over a period of time of the deployment of those technologies. So that gives us a nice little void, there's a nice little space there that can be filled by rhetoric, uh, policy rhetoric or rhetoric coming from the media or attitudes. Uh, extreme attitudes sometimes coming from different sources. So these different vested interests will express their attitudes in this space. Um, and I think that drove on CCTV. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see, well we have seen that in the UK, but I wouldn't be surprised if you start to see that more in New Zealand. Different voices emerging about how body-worn video cameras will be used in the future. And if you like, there's a, that those, those, those vested interests and voices will, will, will be played out over time and will result in one sort of diffusion or another. So you, you know, I don't know if CC can do the same thing, but it seems to me there's often a, an adolescent phase of the excitability of the possibilities and, yep. and then you go through that maturity phase, yep. um, which possibly CC yep. will be, is that it is disappointing yep. that the lessons yep. of the I, I think you've read my PhD. Um, but uh, yeah, so basically you, you can look at diffusion cycles and you can look at the way that um, over time technologies diffuse, they get more sophisticated but also governance arrangements become embedded around them. So you could say that we're at a very initial phase, which you call the Wild West, but you could say we're at a very initial phase of, if you like, experimentation, piloting. Let's see what the technology might do in practice, and I think maybe that's what the you know the the, the, the kind of the, the story I told about the way the police have readjusted the way they talk about body worn cameras is part of that experimentation, um, part of that redefining what the technology is and what it does. Um, so yeah, I certainly think we're at, but you see that with other technologies. You see that, with, for example, with the smart cities technologies, and you see it with big data. You know, we, we we don't know what all these technologies can do. We're we're exploring and. That the risk is that sometimes this exploration happens at the at, at, happens so quickly that other um, good governance practices get pushed aside slightly and have to be brought back into the agenda. Um, just uh, looking at uh, possible improvements in behaviour by the uh, police and the crowds and things like this. Uh, having been in a number of demonstrations in London, where the, uh, I felt that. Police definitely overreacted, and there was bad behaviour on both sides of the fence. Um, is, is it, has, has the technology been around for long enough in that situation to have modified that type of behaviour? Things like uh, uh, you know, soccer hooliganism and mm -hmm. this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that we will we will have increasing evidence of of these sorts of scenarios. Um, you know, I'm not going to cast aspersions about how police operate in different parts of the world, but um, there does seem to be a call that um, it's going to be helpful for the police to have more body-worn video cameras because um, they can be held to account more easily, but also they will be able to provide evidence. Actually, uh, they, they have a lot of good practice when, when dealing with, with citizens. Um, there are also incidences of poor practice, so hopefully you know, we'll, we'll, they will be able to iron these things out. So I think this is an area where we're going to learn. We're going to learn more as more evidence emerges over time. I think we've got here first. And then we're yeah, um, so you talked about the, the robust research that police had done and found, they found a 30% fall in the number of complaints. Yeah. So I guess I'd like to hear more about that. And what was the mechanism? Is it that people make the same number of complaints but they're not upheld? Or is it yeah, that they're was, actually preventing complaints? In the yeah, that, that, was, that was what they were counting. So. They were comparing officers who didn't wear cameras with officers who did wear cameras. It was quite a simple, simple methodology. Um, and, and what they were counting was that the officers that wore cameras didn't have as many complaints made against them. So it didn't have as many complaints made against them. Um, and then there was a subsequent question about, well, when a complaint was made against them, how many were upheld? But that's a, that's a more qualitative uh, piece of evidence. So it is, the implication of that for me is that it's actually modifying the police behaviour. Possibly. To not yeah. Knowing that yeah. somebody is watching. Yeah. I think this is, this is one, of the, one of the interesting things about the surveillance society, that well, there's so much for us to learn about the way it changes our behaviour. Um, and this is, an, this is a case in point. That 
Um, there does seem to be some early indicators, even if they're not very qualitative, some early indicators on people changing behaviour around the use of the technology. But equally, you know, equally there was also other anecdotal evidence of, you know, it's not that difficult to just uh, you know, drop your drop your camera, you know, and. Uh, Sorry, yeah. So, and so these things are possible to happen, and if we don't start thinking about those kind of things in that void that we've got, then take not the law and everything else, public policy will be trying to play catch up to this shiny new toy that is big data and all of the possibilities that surround it. Yeah, so um, you know, you're talking about uh, an integration of different types of technology and information sharing, um, and that may happen in other instances, um, certainly with different, uh, around big data for example. When we're looking at body-worn video cameras, we are a long way from that at the moment. That's not to say it won't happen in the future, but at the moment the kit is relatively rudimentary. Um, and public services who are purchasing this kit and using it are doing it with very little uh, capital expenditure. So it's seen as a relatively cheap solution to a number of different issues. Um, they have downloaded it, yeah. Um, uh, I wasn't aware of any instances where any of that, those data were being shared or, or integrated into big data sets. Um, those agencies were all operating pretty much in isolation. The kit was pretty much work operating in isolation. But again, as I repeat, that's not to say it might change in the future. Um, um, so um, I have done other lectures since I've been here about big data and public services and, and, some of the, uh, and some of the risks associated with personal data and data sharing, but it's not really a particular issue for this piece of research. I mentioned there was a reduction in incidents in the second case study for Capricorn, so what kind of reduction was that and over what period? Okay, um, I think it would be very difficult to quantify um, it was given to us very anecdotally, um, and it was essentially the uh, managers and the traffic wardens themselves telling us how um, the members of the public had changed their behaviour. Um, there was at least one instance, they were, all traffic wardens are able to recount stories of being abused, um, being verbally abused in particular, um, and they're all able to recount stories of how um, when they said to people, "Do you realise that you are under, you are, you are on being captured by this this surveillance camera?" They're all able to recount stories of people then suddenly changing their behaviour. Not always to the better. Sometimes people are are inflamed already about getting a parking ticket, and that's the final straw. Um, so th th there is evidence going in both ways, but it's very, very anecdotal. Um, is there any uniformity or consistency? across these different agencies that you studied using the cameras and how long they keep the data for? Yeah, okay, so um, what I would say was the answer is no. So one of the four case studies kept the data for two weeks. That was driven by a technical element of their system, that basically they were collecting so much data that the system couldn't store it. So their two weeks deadline was driven by technical considerations, not not considerations in relation to the use of personal data. The, ex the most excessive use was three months uh, by one of the agencies, and the, um, the police, which might be around more like the norm for CCTV, were 31 days. Um, so, so very different, very different practices. I would say the one good area of practice is that all four agencies knew that they had to have different requirements in place in terms of who is allowed to take away access to that footage. So they all had a retention period for the footage in general and then a different retention period if the footage was going to be used in a court of law. So that was one thing I felt that they was, that was standardised. 
or, or at least there was a differentiation that was standardized. If you come across a case where the stored data have been processed automatically, apart from individual scenes being retrieved for evidence or something like this, a, a blanket automatic processing voice face recognition or something? No, no, not, not on the systems we looked at. The, the only level of automation we saw was um, where an incident occurred and they were able to identify the time and then basically the, the footage could be just go straight to that, that incident. That was the only automation we really saw. Well, thanks. Uh, well, yeah, I think we're, we're just a bit up to one, so I'll wrap it up there. Um, well, hopefully New Zealand can um, learn from the UK experience. It sounds like there's some, there's some good lessons there for us to learn in, in the use of body-worn cameras. So thanks very much, William. My pleasure.